Thank you for joining us today at the Big Bang 2020, the Next 100 Years Conference to discuss issues of, of a critical nature to our state, uh, specifically focused on public education and what we are doing collectively to drive improvements in equity as a result of the way that our public education system works. My name is Mike Morath. I'm commissioner of the Texas Education Agency. And today we have the uh, good fortune of having this discussion about equity in education with four tremendous school system leaders in the state of Texas. Uh, Michael Hinojosa from Dallas ISD, a man who I worked with very closely um, in my former role on the board in Dallas, um, is uh, a leader uh, 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 beyond re repute. Uh, he, in fact, just coming off the, um, his um, national award from the Council of Great City Schools for his commitment to excellence in urban education. Uh, Granita Latham, who leads the largest school system in Texas, ably helming it um, through uh, not just the pandemic, but even prior to that, uh, what has happened because of Hurricane Harvey, um, with, again, a commitment to all students uh, in that system. Pedro Martinez, superintendent of, of San Antonio ISD, leading um, some of the most significant structural changes um, focused on equity. Uh, and in fact, uh, serving in, in many ways as the germinating point of some key equity legislation in the school finance system, uh, given, given tremendous work in San Antonio. And then also new to Austin ISD, not uh, new to me though, Stephanie Elizalde, uh, the superintendent of, of Austin ISD, um, of course, highly skilled former uh, uh, chief school leadership um, out of Dallas ISD. Um, and uh, Austin is very lucky to have her uh, steady hand during this uh, very unusual time in public education. And uh, Stephanie, by the way, as a parent of two Austin ISD kids, uh, thank you for your leadership, uh, for all that you do to make our schools uh, great. When, when we think about this conversation of improving equity in, um, in public education, you know, I think it is, it's easy for us to sometimes get lost in um, the emotionalism or the moralism of the charge. People who work in public education, the four leaders that you'll hear from shortly, but all 700,000 people who work in public schools in Texas do so because they love kids. We, uh, you know, love children. I have the blessing to have a job that allows me to wake up every day and think about how to help five and a half million souls. Like, there is nothing better. Um, but we don't love children to high levels of academic proficiency. Love is a minimum first ingredient, but it requires excellence and it requires really a relentless focus on improving performance because these are big systems. We spend $70 billion a year on public education. We need to know whether or not um, we are getting real results for kids and not just deluding ourselves out of uh, um, our emotional attachments. So it is, it is I think it's critical to lead with love. These are, um, schools are this institution that helps mold eager young minds to become the best versions of themselves. But it's also important to look critically at how the system is working. And so for that, we have a variety of sources of, uh, of data, um, hard and soft, at our fingertips. And when we reflect on the crisis that we're all um, faced with now, the global pandemic, the impact that is uh, coronavirus, we have um, uh, some significant challenges. The, the statewide summative uh, picture of performance that we would normally use to get a sense of data. Um, we, we weren't in school. We didn't even conduct it. So we don't know um, how big the gaps uh, uh, were as the school year closed out. But we do have some data sources that I think inform um, just how significantly challenging this work is. What you see on slide here is a graph from a, a fairly popular mathematics online math um, uh, learning system called Zern. It's used around the country and also in some schools in Texas. And um, this is a picture both pre and post COVID from the spring. The sort of horizontal line of zero is normal weekly progress. And you can see that uh, some weeks it's a little slower than others, but by and large, kids are, are making progress each week that appears to be normal. Um, and then what happens is the COVID closures hit in mid-March. And you begin to see a tale of three cities, as it were. Um, what happens for families that are wealthy? what happened with their children? 
Um, and you, what you see in terms of the mathematics uh, uh, progress that their children made on a weekly basis post-crisis is it didn't slow down, and in fact, in some cases, it sped up. For middle-income families and for low-income families, it immediately fell off a cliff. Almost all academic progress stopped. Um, but then quickly our schools adjusted and we began to recover. And for uh, middle-income students, um, uh, by the time that we really wrapped our arms around this huge instructional pivot that we needed to make as a system, we got back to largely normal. But for low-income uh, kids, the rate of progress that we made in the spring, the best rate of progress that we made in the spring, was still 30% lower than normal. This is the impact that COVID-19 is having on our kids. And it's, uh, it's, this is clearly not the equitable uh, system of public education that we wish it to be. And you're going to hear from the four school leaders um, that are with us today who are going to talk about all of the changes that they have made um, uh, in general and then as a result of COVID-19. And, and you're not going to find four more committed uh, leaders uh, in the state to, to these challenges. But the challenges are real. If we look at what uh, the world looked like even before COVID hit, this um, slide gives you a, a picture, sort of the, the waterfront from, from how well our pre-K efforts were, were working to get kids uh, kindergarten ready, all the way to how many of our kids system-wide obtained either a four-year degree, a two-year degree, or um, even uh, an industry credential. And we're still well short of our goals for all kids, but um, uh, and, and, while our mission is to improve outcomes for all kids, I think this um, equity lens is important to break the information down by. So let's take a look just, for example, at third grade reading and split out the overall number, which you can see improvement has been happening in Texas, but it's still less than half of kids are reading on grade level in third grade. And we take that overall number and see how it breaks down first by class. And... Um, and the class breakdowns are stark. 61% uh, of middle and upper income kids in our public school system are reading on grade level. Only 35% of low income kids are reading on grade level. And um, in some ways, class um, is really the primary picture of, uh, uh, of this, this disequity that uh, can exist. But we can't lose sight of race as a factor as well. So um, here what you see on the, the gra the, these graphs is let's split out those two average state average numbers for non-economically disadvantaged, think middle income and upper income kids, and economically disadvantaged kids. And so you can see the, the starting point, the average is already, is already broken down where it's 61% for uh, middle income kids and 35% um, of low income kids are meeting grade level. But um, if we layer on that the picture of race, um, we see other distinctions. Um, students of Asian descent are significantly outperforming the state averages in both regards, but you can also see a big difference between the haves and have-nots, even within this uh, racial group. Within every racial group, there are still big differences between the haves and have-nots, but there are still noticeable differences inside the same class, the same economic status, but um, big differences even by race. And the question that we have to ask ourselves as educators, um, first and foremost, is why does this exist? Because only from understanding why this is the case can we build action plans to do something about it, to, to deliver to our children on the moral commitment that is public education, the great equalizer. And so I'm going to talk for just a moment um, about why um, uh, students may be experiencing different levels of reading proficiency. Like, really, how does the brain work? Um, because if we don't understand exactly how children learn how to read um, and how that might manifest itself differently by class or by race, um, then how are we going to solve these challenges of equity and drive towards excellence for all kids? So uh, what does the science tell us? Well, the science tells us that reading is not simple. Uh, there, there is nothing simple about it. Um, uh, but if we try to break it down into its component parts, there is, in fact, a theory of reading that they call the simple view of reading, 
um, that you can think of as a mathematical formula. Decoding times language comprehension equals um, reading comprehension. And so what, is this, what does this mean? What, is the, what do the cognitive scientists tell us um, uh, about the practice of reading, how the human mind acquires the written word? Well, we'll start with decoding. Um, decoding is this concept of taking these weird abstract symbols, because that's what it starts with little kids. My youngest are not yet in public school, the, the two-year-olds, and they're looking at pictures and words and letters, and it's all a jumbled mess. Um, but what we have to do for them is unlock the magic of these symbols, transforming um, a symbol into something that is a letter, this letter uh, D, and in fact the meaningful piece of reading is not that it's called a D, it's that it makes a sound, D, 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 because then we can begin blending individual sounds together, dr, 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 which is very different than say dr, because that's not what the sound is, it's dr. Um, uh, and so uh, once kids begin to understand this relationship between the symbols um, and sounds that they make, they can begin to sound it out. Like all of, you, you can recall when you were a kid and mama saying, sound it out, baby. Um, uh, and this was just the same thing that I do with my kids while I'm trying to help them. So I can follow one you know, letter at a time, left to right, while I'm kind of reading, and suddenly these weird symbols become dressed as a word. And so I can make um, the transformation of all these abstract symbols into first words and then whole sentences and paragraphs. Um, that is the art of decoding. But that, uh, as it turns out, is only part of the puzzle because I got to know what these words mean. So you think about the word emperor. What does the word emperor mean? What does that, maybe I can decode this word, but uh, do I actually know what it means? Do I know that there's this thing called an empire and it's different than like a city, that it's, um, you know, it's helmed by typically an all-powerful ruler because you're going to treat an emperor somewhat differently than you treat a mayor <laughs> just because um, of, you know, risk factors with, you know, I don't know, off, off with their headism that, that comes. And so there's like a lot of background knowledge that has to come into uh, really knowing vocabulary, understanding language. Think about the word fine, which you think of like, how are you feeling today, sweetie? Well, I'm, I'm fine, you know, thumbs up. But fine has a lot of other, other meanings. Like if I have a, 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 a pen, is it fine tipped? Is it wide tipped? Um, these are, this is a completely different meaning that has nothing to do with like, I'm feeling okay. Or, you know, when, um, when you know, maybe you're uh, driving a little fast and officer friendly pulls you over, you are not gonna feel fine when he delivers you a fine. Um, this is a completely different meaning of the word. And the question is, do our kids know this? Do they have the background knowledge? And then you get to an even more obscure use of fine, at least in our modern parlance. When I look at a sculpture or uh, a garment, and that um, is of the highest quality, it is the craftsmanship is truly fine. And we come back to this second or third grade text, which is from the great Hans Christian Andersen classic of the emperor's new clothes. And we read these sentences, we read these words. Many years ago, there lived an emperor who loved beautiful new clothes so much that he spent all his money on being finely dressed. His only interest was in going to the theater or in riding about in his carriage where he could show off his new clothes. And if I know how to decode, because my school has taught me that, do I know all the words? Do I have the background knowledge of every word that is on, that is in these two sentences? Because if I don't, if I take away some of the meaning, then when our kids read these words, because of whatever background knowledge that they have picked up, either because our schools have directly taught it to them or because mom and dad taught it to them, if, if we remove words, we remove that background knowledge, reading does not happen, even when we do teach decoding. This takes us back to the simple view of reading. Decoding times language comprehension equals reading comprehension. And if you, uh, again, you ground yourself in the neuroscience and you ground this discussion of equity in the data, what we actually see from the evidence base is that you have to do both. That both sides of this equation matter. Decoding, you think of it as, say, reading ability, but also language comprehension. You think about the knowledge that kids have. And this has been well studied. 
the, there is a difference between teaching kids to decode and not teaching them to decode. And many kids, if we don't teach them to decode, they will not read. But even if we do, if we don't invest heavily, formally, in building their knowledge, their background knowledge, um, there are big differences in how they will experience first the academic environment of school, but second, how they will experience America. And that's what you see on this graph, that having high levels of knowledge combined with high reading ability, that is the goal. And you, you come back to this discussion of equity and you think back to this graph that we looked at before we went down this sort of wonky picture of how do we learn how to read. And are there differences that we think kids bring to school from the home because of the advantages or disadvantages of their backgrounds. You know, my kids come to school and mom is a doctor. I'm a lucky man, I married a doctor. Uh, and dad, you know, uh, I don't know, doesn't shut up. Anybody who's heard me give a speech knows that's to be true. So, like, there is a large amount of conversation happening in our household. But more than that, uh, I was, a, you know, uh, I've been blessed to have been a successful software entrepreneur. My kids don't lack for resources. We go on vacations. I mean, at least before COVID, we would you know, gallivant all across the United States. And imagine having a conversation about the Grand Canyon if you've seen it yourself. These are the differences that our kids walk into school with. That, you know, these are hard differences for us to do anything about. But what we can get very serious about is what our schools are doing to level the playing field on those differences, to make sure that whether you have seen the Grand Canyon personally or not, you will know what the Grand Canyon is. That is, is the importance of strong, rich curriculum, of well-trained teachers, of schools that get relentless at thinking about everything their kids bring to the table and their kids don't bring to the table and say, we will be responsible for ensuring that the system of public education is in fact the great equalizer. We will be attentive to all of these things. In Texas, writ large, is perhaps more committed to equity than, uh, certainly than we get credit for, but than, in, than most states have as a matter of public policy for our school systems. Um, you think about what our kids come to the table with. In Texas, we fully fund full day pre-K for four-year-olds, and even pre-K for three-year-olds has been funded in Texas since the mid-90s. This is, um, there are states out there that don't even fund kindergarten. We have actually like three more grade levels in Texas that are funded under the foundation school program than in most states, fully funded for four-year-olds um, and of course for kindergartners um, and uh, funded on a half day for, for three-year-olds, but a, uh, an investment in a reading allotment that is focused on covering all kids um, throughout this age span. This is a huge act of public policy that the legislature has um, started the, down this path in, in the mid-90s, but with the passage of House Bill 3, um, this omnibus legislation um, uh, that was passed last uh, session, we've made even a deeper commitment to leveling the playing field for all kids to ensure that they have access to this kind of structured curricular exposure, um, a rich um, environment in, in, in pre-kindergarten. Uh, we are also making this significant investment in our teachers. House Bill 3 that was passed by the legislature last session will, um, sets up the stage for every K-3 through teacher, every, really every K-3 through educator, including principals, instructional coaches, you name it, to go through a year-long fellowship, a deep dive on uh, uh, reading practices with an equity lens. To, um, and in fact, in the, for the first time, I actually think in, in U.S. history, um, the reading academies in Texas were, were built um, with an entire strand focused on uh, students who don't speak English as a native language, or the, a biliteracy pathway, so that uh, uh, regardless of the students that you're served in your classroom, that, uh, that Texas is making an investment in our teachers so that they have all of the grounding in the neuroscience and the best practices possible, because we have to invest in our teachers. Our teachers are, in fact, um, they are the neurosurgeons working on the eager young minds every day in our classrooms. This commitment to the Reading Academies is foundational and it will be a huge driver for all kids, regardless of if you're in a small rural hamlet or the big inner city, regardless if you're poor or rich, it is, a, it is an equitable commitment. But beyond that, the legislature has set the path to give our kids the gift of time. 
when we think about the school year historically in, in the state of Texas in the United States, it's been based on this, you know, agrarian calendar. Uh, starts in, uh, you know, September-ish, ends around May-ish. Um, uh, uh, what, what has historically been measured about 175 days out of the year um, for teaching. Well, you know, the brains don't turn off when school shuts off. And so the question is, for low-income students who may be li not like my kids, who can't, you know, go to uh, Chattanooga and see the, um, uh, the, the, the Civil War battlefield from the Battle of Chickamauga, um, if they can't see that in the summer because their parents don't have the opportunity to provide that, maybe we can create more resources so that the schools can do that kind of intervention all year long, that we can provide that top-notch education all year long. The legislature has created the opportunity in the elementary grades for every school in Texas, should it choose, to, to go to 210 days of instruction. This is a commitment unparalleled in U.S. history, although many of the Asian countries have already gone there um, uh, with very significant results for their kids. This is a huge commitment statewide to equity, this picture of, of, of what are we going to do to drive better results for all of our kids, regardless of their background. And last but not least, we get back again to teachers, where it matters most. And the legislature set up something called the Teacher Incentive Allotment, in fact modeled in many ways on what Dr. Hinojosa has already done in Dallas, which is we know that not every teacher is equally skilled. Some of them um, uh, just have, have been working on the craft and refining their work um, and, uh, in fact, are delivering better results. We also know that not every classroom is uh, similarly difficult. So the, uh, there are uh, communities where kids are coming into the school with far more challenges. And so if we know this, why don't we do something about it? And Dallas uh, set the stage uh, as a model for the state on this uh, statewide. And so the legislature has created a funding incentive that says, we will help support teachers who are driving towards excellence with a lens towards equity so that our highest performing teachers in our highest need schools, a school district can draw down, uh, on top of everything else, can draw down an extra $30,000, $32,000 per year per teacher. This will drive teachers towards six-figure salaries, but not because they're working in places where all the kids are um, you know, wealthy and coming in with all the advantages in the home, but actually specifically focused where, um, where we know we need the best educators, where our kids uh, need us to be at our absolute best um, in some of our more um, resource-deprived uh, communities. This is what's been built into the legislative framework in Texas, a commitment to excellence and equity unparalleled in the United States. Um, but of course, what it takes is skilled leadership and a collective commitment to our kids. Public schools are schools that the public owns. These are um, very difficult um, uh, systems to make work. There's a, you know, the, the job of molding eager young minds is not for the faint at heart. And we, the public, we've, we can't abdicate our ownership of this. We've got to get involved. But uh, it also just takes really strong leadership at each of our school systems. And with the four leaders that are here today, you have examples of strong leaders uh, leading school systems. And so thank you for um, uh, uh, being here at the conference today. Thank you for your interest in this topic. And I, I hope that everybody leaves today, you know, um, signing up to volunteer as a mentor, big brother, big sister, to, as, a, as a reading coach, as a, as a, as a a thought partner for a principal, as somebody you know, willing to bring a love offering in from uh, to your teachers, uh, 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 just praying for our kids and our teachers. Um, uh, and if any of you, uh, uh, you know, like me, think that you know maybe you should run for office and try to stand up on the school board, I will say one, you've probably lost your mind. But two, um, it takes good people to stand up. And, um, and run and help support uh, our school systems to serve in positions of leadership, to be on uh, school boards, unpaid, um, unpaid positions. So again, I encourage everybody here to, to reflect on how um, individually uh, uh, the role that you play, the, the resources that you have, how you can bring it to bear to help, um, help our educators in our schools. Because only if we all work together can we really drive equitable improvements for all Texas public uh, school kids. Thanks for being here today. God bless.